going to talk today a bit about consciousness, since this is the Consciousness Festival, and specifically about consciousness as it relates to intelligent machines, since my main line of research is artificial intelligence research, trying to build machines that can think in the same sense that people do, and ultimately with greater general intelligence than human beings have. First of all, I should say I don't think it's necessary to fully understand consciousness in order to build thinking machines. And myself and my AI collaborators, one of the diversity of different views on what consciousness is and on whether and in what sense the machines we're trying to build will be conscious. Similarly, we don't really need to understand consciousness to interact with each other in a way that sort of takes consciousness into account. For example, I, I can't prove to you that I'm conscious. You can't prove to me that you're conscious, at least not in any scientific way, yet we sort of do take for granted that each other are conscious and that we go about our ordinary lives without making a big deal of it most of the time. And similarly, I think we can engineer a thinking machine we can teach it to communicate in human language. It can control a robot body and walk around. It can control a video game character inside the game world, which is something I'm working on now with a team here at, at PolyU. We can chat with this AI and say, hey, Mr. AI, are you conscious? And the AI will talk back and say, well, yeah, of course I'm conscious, you idiot. What do you think? They'll say, well, can you prove you're conscious? And the AI says, no. Can you prove you're conscious? I'll say, well, not really. And then the AI and I may get bored with that topic. Just like you and I get bored with this sort of topic in ordinary life. In other words, it may be that once artificial intelligences act as if they're conscious and say they feel conscious, at that point their consciousness may become a moot point, just as consciousness is a moot point in ordinary human life. Having said that, that I don't think understanding consciousness is necessarily critical for creating intelligent machines. Nevertheless, I think understanding the nature of consciousness is a very interesting thing. It's an interesting topic. As a conscious thinking being, I can't help but wonder what is it that I'm doing when I'm aware, when I experience the world. My own tendency regarding consciousness theory lies in the direction of panpsychism, which I understand as the, the hypothesis that everything that is, is conscious to some extent. This, of course, is a very old theory of consciousness underlying the animistic beliefs of pre-civilized tribes. It underlies many aspects of Buddhism, Taoism, and other current wisdom traditions. You can argue that panpsychism is a <coughs> you can argue that panpsychism is the most common theory of consciousness in human history. However, it's not that popular in modern Western civilization. It doesn't fit that well with the most common interpretations of modern Western science. But I think that's a mistake on, on the part of science. I think the attempts to make theories of consciousness in which some parts of the universe are conscious and other parts of the universe are not conscious, I think that division is, is ultimately going to be seen as a conceptual mistake. Panpsychism has the advantage of being logically coherent and consistent. You can say everything is conscious to some extent and in its own way, and then different kinds of system display different kinds and perhaps different extents of consciousness. Whereas when you start to say, well, there's matter, which is not conscious, then there's conscious experience out there somewhere else that somehow interacts with this matter, which is not conscious, you run into all sorts of conceptual uh, conundrums. And there's a number of books and papers by the academic philosopher Galen Strawson who has dug into this and tried to argue, in his view, that physicalism entails panpsychism. That if you 
argue the world is physical, you must also believe everything in the world is conscious. And he, he proceeds in the manner of analytical philosophy, showing that positing some conscious realm separate from the physical realm ultimately gets you into various conceptual paradoxes. Another solution is the one the philosopher Daniel Dennett has put forward, which is basically subjective experience, conscious awareness is just bullshit. And it's not there. Basically he says, you know, you say you have these experiences that are somehow different than matter, but that's just nonsense. I don't believe you. And it's hard to know how to argue against that. It's not compelling to me personally, but I can't convince him that I have a, a conscious experience, or that he does. So ultimately, with these things, one starts to feel like one's just running around in circles uselessly. And I'd rather focus on, on building thinking machines or, or something more productive. But as I said, my, my tendency is toward panpsychism as the beginning for understanding how consciousness works. But I, I think that's only the beginning. It doesn't tell you that much, right? If you say, okay, everything in the universe is conscious to some extent, Nevertheless, the consciousness of, say, this microphone in my head has got to be rather different than the consciousness of the brain inside my head or the collective consciousness of the group of all people in this room. You then begin to look at human-like consciousness as the manifestation of universal consciousness that's associated with the reflective self-understanding that the human brain mind has, that's associated with the feeling of willing and causing that human beings have. Just because everything is consciousness doesn't mean all types of consciousness are exactly the same. And part of what we mean when we talk about human consciousness is the particular manifestations of the universal consciousness that go along with the human-like brain structure. So when we talk about self-awareness at a high level, like my, my knowledge, you know, I'm Ben Gertzel, I'm an AI researcher, I'm a human being, I have two arms and, and two legs, I can jump up and down like an idiot. I mean, this, this self-knowledge, this self-awareness is something beyond kind of raw elemental consciousness that's imminent in being. This higher level self-awareness and self-modeling is a kind of consciousness that's associated with the reflective analytical capabilities of, of the human mind. So where do we go from here? Let's say that panpsychism is correct. Let's say that panpsychism is, is the right way to look at, at consciousness. And let's say that science can understand something about the particular ways consciousness manifests itself in human beings. For example, by imaging what happens in the brain when people report different kinds of experiences. We can do that much better now than a couple of decades ago. You can ask people, well, what are you experiencing? What kind of state of consciousness are you in? And then you can connect the right kind of instrumentation to their brain and you can see where the electricity is flowing in their brain, what kind of patterns and dynamics are happening in their brain when they report certain kinds of experience. And Jeffrey Martin, who we'll be talking later today, is doing some really interesting work in this direction, looking at enlightened states, or as he would call them, states of consciousness of extraordinary well-being, and looking at the the activity in the posterior cingulate cortex and different parts of the brain that correlate with these subjectively perceived states of extraordinary well-being. So this is, is really cool. I'm not sure panpsychism has much to add to, to that view. What it's doing is probing into the correlates of what happens in the brain with the experiences that people report, which is, is really, really interesting. So an interesting question is how to go beyond the level of understanding of consciousness that we have now. Philosophies like panpsychism are pretty broad, 
and correlating brain states with reports of people's consciousness is interesting, but somehow not, seems not to get at the crux of the matter. It's fair to say that science in its current form fails at getting a really incisive understanding of consciousness because it doesn't really deal with what <coughs> Chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness. It doesn't deal with the interaction between our feeling of subjective experience and what is measured going on in the brain. The best you can do is find correlations between those two things rather than understanding a fundamental connection between the two. On the other hand, in a certain sense, it's also fair to say that religious, spiritual, and wisdom traditions have not succeeded all that thoroughly either. There are technologies, you could call them, within various wisdom traditions for helping people to achieve enlightened states of consciousness and to otherwise control and modulate their states of consciousness, but yet these don't work all that well, which is why we don't have peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and all that good stuff, and why there, there's not all that many enlightened people out there among all the religious people in, in the world and all the people who are trying. And so I think it's fair to say that both science and the spiritual disciplines still have a, have a lot to learn about consciousness and could use help from something else, from some other way of thinking. And again, I'll mention Jeffrey Martin, who's pushing in this direction in a certain extent. He's looking at neurofeedback. He's looking at tools for measuring what's happening in your brain when you're in different states of consciousness, with the idea that this can help you control your state of consciousness and achieve a state of extraordinary well-being by as you meditate, or as you think, or as you put your mind in a certain state, you can see on the screen what your brain state is doing. And then by fixating on changing the image on the screen of your brain state, you can more rapidly change what's, what's happening inside your mind. So this is one kind of way to go beyond traditional science and traditional religious or, or spiritual modes of inquiry. But I'm not sure it goes far enough. And, I've thought a bit about what could, what could go even further. So I've thought a bit about what kind of new discipline, new way of collectively thinking could incorporate aspects of science together with aspects of religious and, and spiritual inquiry into some new form of, of collective understanding that could help us understand consciousness better. When you think about it, there's actually a lot of commonality between what sciences do and what religions do. I mean, both of them are means of having a group of people come together to collectively agree on what, what assumptions they want to make about the world. Science is not purely about empirical observations and mathematical derivations. In science, there's always some assumption you must make. Even if you assume the view of Occam's razor, always take the simplest hypothesis, there's an assumption, a subjective judgment of what is simpler. And the scientific community collectively agrees on what is simpler. They collectively agree on what assumptions to make in understanding the world. And of course, religions, even when they trace their ideas back to some holy book or something, nevertheless, they adapt, revise, and improve their ideas over time in sort of collective process where the whole group understands what assumptions they want to make. You also have common to science and religion a sort of interplay between an egoic self-focus and a relaxation of the self and opening up to the community. I mean, in, in science, there, there's a phase of work when you're very egoic. You're like, I want to prove the greatest math theorem in history. I want to win the Nobel Prize. I'm going to do this. Me, me, me. But then after you've done that, you submit your discoveries to the scientific community to refine and approve and, and test. Similarly, in, in the spiritual domain, you can get into all kinds of out there, exalted, transcendent states of consciousness, individually and in the context of ritual activities. But then, except in the very rare case of enlightened monks, you're going to go back to your ordinary everyday life, going about doing everyday things, and you have to integrate these transcendent insights into yourself, into your ordinary frame of mind. So. In both science and religion, 
you have the aspect of a group of people coming together to collectively decide what assumptions to make about the world, and you have the aspect of a sort of iterative going back and forth between an egoic self-focus and a focus more on the, on the community and then communal understanding. Now, I think you could have something else new that incorporates both of these aspects, but in a way that's different from either science or, or spirituality. And this is kind of out there. It's a bit of science fiction, so I'll wrap up with this. But here's what I'm thinking now. Imagine you had a, a collective of people, or there could be people on AIs, or some of them could be cyborgs, the people's brains decked into the computers. And imagine that they're concerned with a number of things. First, they're concerned with measuring each other's brain states and making scientific theories about what they observe. Second, they're observed more, more in the matter of a, a group of people meditating together. They're actually subjectively perceiving each other's consciousness while they're doing this. And so they can both measure each other's states of consciousness empirically and neurally or digitally if they're AIs and they can subjectively enter into collective mind states. But there's another ingredient. Human beings have the annoying property that if you cut open our heads and mess with our brains, we tend to die or become gibbering idiots or something. But a, a computer program won't necessarily have this feature. And with molecular nanotechnology, humans won't necessarily have this feature either. So you can imagine that this sort of uh, ashram of, of consciousness scientists who are studying each other's brains and minds and experiencing each other's states of consciousness in a very refined way. You can imagine this happening in a situation where the, the members of this community could actually alter and adjust each other's brains experimentally and, and dynamically during the collective process. Now, what you see here is the possibility for <coughs> some form of collective understanding going beyond science as we have it now and going beyond religion as we have it now, whether you can get this new form of understanding using humans as we exist now, I'm not sure. It's easier to envision with the AIs and cyborgs and all this in, in the mix. Will this lead us beyond panpsychism as a basic view of consciousness in the universe? I'm not sure. I think panpsychism has some basic truth to it, but on its own it doesn't tell you very much. It doesn't give the fundamental connection between different structures in the brain and in the world and different varieties of, of subjective experience. And building that connection between the structures in the world and the varieties of conscious experience associated with those structures, I think that's really the important problem that we need to confront and we may need to break down some of the barriers between scientific pursuit and spiritual or wisdom pursuit and try to craft something new to get to that kind of understanding.